Hey, stranger, I've got a secret for you. Oh, what is it? I sell great hats. Hats? Oh, come on. I mean, they can't be that. Oh, these are great hats. Ladies, gentlemen, and pals of all ages, at this point I've been playing Power World since its early access release, and well, let's just say the amount of it that I've played would probably be considered unhealthy if this wasn't what I do for a living. That said, with all that time and experience comes quite a lot of knowledge of the way the game functions, and there are so many things that I didn't even realize until just recently that would have made the game as a whole just so much more approachable early on, and would have significantly eased the difficulty of pushing into the later stages of the game, especially things like crafting some of the more hefty resources. So I thought it'd be fun to just sit down and talk about 10 things that I wish I knew earlier in my Pal World journey, in the hopes that the knowledge can help some of you out too. Starting out then, first things first, before you even dive into the game, there is a World Settings Options menu that as you get ready to load. In the Settings menu, there are a billion ways to customize your game experience, and you can even change these in an active game after the fact too, after you started the game. So be aware of what these settings are, and consider if you want to fiddle with any of them as you go. For example, the experience grind can get a bit ridiculous at higher levels, so if you you are someone who just wants to actually feel the experience of the game without that insane grind requirement, there is this experience gain multiplier. If you love the concept of breeding pals but hate the idea of having to wait for hours and hours to hatch a single egg, there's pretty handy duration settings here too that let you bring it down to even just an hour for the biggest of eggs, or even make all eggs just incubate completely instantly if you want the rush of the hatch without all the waiting. There's also settings like pal appearance rate, which I don't recommend having on permanently but can make various farming parts of the game much easier. As what it does, does is literally triple every pal that spawns, but that does include things like alpha world bosses and dungeon bosses too, so generally I'd recommend being aware of this setting and knowing that you can fiddle with it and turn it on and on occasion, but don't leave it on permanently for sure. Second up then, one of the biggest annoyances that I had earlier on in my base building experiences is hitting maximum weight. You can level up the weight limit stat when you level, but that seems like a bit of a waste most of the time compared to the other options, but it's incredibly easy, especially when you've got stone pits and logging sites set up in your base, to instantly be become just massively past your weight limit, barely able to move, even though they did make this better in the recent patch, but you can just see a storage box just a little bit of distance away. In these moments, you can actually whip out your grappling hook, which are makeable from a relatively early level in the game, and use it at full effectiveness, even when completely overloaded with items. Of course, the main benefit of this is just moving resources around your base from one part of it to another, but it can really save a lot of early irritation to use this trick. On that note, when it comes to setting your base up early on, it may feel like you have a ridiculous amount of space compared to the amount of things that you have to set up, but as you continue the game, that you'll unlock more and more base activities or work functions that you'll want to take advantage of, and every one of those takes up space in your base. And that base little circle that it gives you to begin with just doesn't start to feel like enough anymore. Yes, you do unlock the ability to have multiple bases later in the game, but even that caps out as three, and the trick is that you don't actually need to make use of these for anything more than you want to. Because one thing a lot of people just sort of don't put much thought into is verticality. This base is still being set up, of course, so it's a work in progress. I'm just showing you these things as an example, but you can see here that we have this full bottom level with tons of different things set up. My factory production belts of various kinds, pal beds, various farming operations, my ranch, logging, mining, a ton of just basic things. I've made the roof two walls high, as there's enough space there for most of the larger pals to maneuver around in your base. Then you can see here we have a staircase that goes up. The reason for this is the entire second floor is an entirely buildable area. As it turns out, the vertical limit of a base is absolutely ridiculous high up. So as long as you give enough space for larger pals to be able to maneuver, if you build large enough staircases, high enough roofs, you can basically build a skyscraper with every floor having a different function, all being technically a part of your base, allowing you to really make use of the amount of pal slots in a high level base, especially as you get pals with more efficient work skills that can simply accomplish more things in a day. On a similar note, this is a smaller thing, but thought I should mention, I always see people struggle with making stairs in this game when you're trying to put buildings together. I struggle with a lot too to begin with, don't get me wrong, but the trick is to place them from above, really. If you make the platform you want to attach the stairs to first, then place stairs from up top of that, it just makes it so much easier. It's also worth mentioning that you can't put walls or anything on a platform that has stairs already on it, but you can place the stairs on a platform that already has walls and such. So when trying to build stairs, you want to put everything else that you want to place on that single square first, then construct the stairs from above after the fact. Fourth up today then, let's talk about something that will save you a bit of a headache and a fair bit of materials and time later in the game too 
which is this item here, the thermal undershirt. This gives you level one cold resistance and it goes in the accessory slot. There is a heat equivalent, but the cold equivalent is technically better as you only unlock cold resistance armor later in the game than you do the heat resistant one. So the fun part of this is that you can have two of these thermal undershirts on at the same time and they stack. And you can also do that while wearing heat resistant armor to simultaneously be fully immune to temperature problems at literally either side of the spectrum at the same time, never having to worry about switching your armor set as a result of that. It does seem to occasionally bug out a little bit. If it does, just take the pieces off and put them back on again and it will fix it. But this just makes you immune to temperature problems. And the fun part of this is while they can drop from RNG in random dungeons or chests, there is also a specific way to purchase these for the measly price of 1,000 gold apiece, which is at the Dune Shelter location in the big desert to the northeast side of the map. Simply buy them from the merchant over here, put them on, and revel in the fact that you never have to change your armor again. Fifth, then let's talk about an interesting bug in the game with a massive effect that you really should be aware of. Within the game, you can interact with these statues of power, found either in random churches around the map, or you can build them at your base. And one of the functions they have is to tell the statue how many leaf bunk effigies you've collected, and in exchange, you, theoretically, you can raise your capture power and make it easier to catch pals. For whatever reason, though, player testing has recently found that this seems to be completely bugged and is actually working backwards. Even though the theoretical capture number does go up, the number you see on screen, the actual results seem to differ with this player testing quite a lot and simply finding that their capture rate with zero of these upgrades was notably higher than their capture rate with full upgrades. So basically you probably shouldn't spend these as it is right now. Collect the leaf monk effigies for sure. There's no problem with that, but I highly recommend not applying these upgrades until this bug is actually fixed as it will simply make your game harder than it should be for now. Six of them, we have a really fun function that starts to matter more towards the mid game, which is riding pals. Various pals in the game have saddles or harnesses or other kinds of pal gear you can lock in the tech tree that lets you actually ride on top of them and control them manually, which also lets you use all of their actual attacks as well with your own aim and timing. What's particularly special about this, but not explicitly stated though, is that the pal attacks have a separate cooldown when being ridden compared to when they are not. Meaning if you have your pal with three super high damage, but high cooldown attacks, you can ride them, launch off all three of the big attacks so they're on cooldown, and that means you can't use them anymore. But then if you hop off your pal, they will use all of their moves again by themselves, putting that on their separate cooldown. Then when you ride again, your riding attack cooldown should still be coming back available to you. Basically, this just lets you take advantage of riding your pals to double their actual effective output and have their effective cooldowns and make much better use of the stronger attacks in the game that come with the high cooldowns than you otherwise could. Because normally the trade-off for a high cooldown, high power move is that you can't use it often, but this sort of works around that. Seventh then today is the Pal Essence Condenser. I have seen way too many people find and unlock this item and be aware of it, but then just ignore it entirely. And while I would say a lot of the usage of this item is more focused towards late to end game, really perfecting a singular pal for a lot of effort, the first stage of Essence Condensing is actually really cheap to do and has a pretty special amount of value. For reference, each time that you condense into a pal, they gain one star level. Each star level is plus 5% to all of their stats, as well as a level boost to their partner skill, which tends to work out around a 10% boost to the effectiveness of the skill too. Whether it be damaging or gathering, whatever it is, even the ones that produce resources at the ranch through the partner skill get a nice increase from this level up. The first level of condensing costs four pals, the second level 16, the third 32, and the final stage 64 pals, which is of course an insane amount. But the thing that I want you to take away from this is that the first stage of condensing only costs four pals, but has the exact same value as going from one star to two star, two star to three star, or even three star to four star. In other words, if you are actively going to be using a pal in your party consistently, it's not hard at all to capture four more of the same pal, that's a small number, and by using the condenser, you get the same value going from zero stars to one star as you would for injecting 64 pals in for the final stage. So you should absolutely consider doing this first stage for things that you actively use, if nothing else. Eighth up then is a sort of workaround, but a really effective one. As you progress into the game, you of course unlock firearms and guns of various kinds, but one thing they all have in common is that you require ammunition to use them. And all those types of ammunition require gunpowder, which requires sulfur, and sulfur can be a bit annoying to farm in large quantities, which is why it's great to know that there is actually a way to avoid ever having to do it. In the actual town areas within the game, there are various vendors, with the one in the green coat over here always selling ammunition at a very reasonable price. The currency that you use for buying these things is gold, which you can get in various ways, but the easiest consistent one is actually selling nails. You can produce nails with nothing but basic metal ingots, and you can produce metal ingots at an astonishing rate in the mid to late game, which means that you can produce nails in excess quite quickly and easily. And as it turns out, selling piles of nails can 
net you quite a lot of gold very quickly. So essentially, rather than building a sulfur farm for just one component of ammunition, you can instead just expand your ore farming operations, sell the nails that you make with them, and then just buy ammunition wholesale. Which, it's worth mentioning, is actually really efficient because one of the components of ammo is also the metal ingots. Ninth, then, actually came from you guys in the comments, and it's specifically an extra powerful way to farm PAL fluid, as it is a highly sought after later game material for a lot of crafting and things, most notably cement, which is required for high tier PAL spheres. Generally speaking, PAL fluid comes from lower tier water type PALs, and the best way to actually farm this on mass is the Gobfin Beach area located right here. It's named after the Gobfin, and once you get here, you will see this area is absolutely being loaded to the brim with these PALs. Bring in a good counter PAL, and just get to cooking, as slaughtering a beach full of these little guys will net you a ridiculous amount of PAL fluid. A bonus tip for this is if you have Or Zerk as a PAL on your party, the high tier electric PAL, his partner skill, just by default, gives you bonus rewards from water type PALs while you have him out, which does of course affect PAL fluid too. Then finally today, something that I always feel bad when I talk about, which is capturing and then butchering PALs. When you kill a PAL, it drops rewards on the floor. If you capture a PAL, you get the exact same rewards, but dropped into your pocket. So on the surface, there's not really an advantage to one over the other if you're just farming for materials. That is, until you consider the existence of the Butcher's Cleaver, which allows you to butcher PALs that you own and get their death materials. So basically, the strat this creates is if you want to double the drops from anything in the game, you can specifically choose to capture it, then also butcher it back at your base. This may be a bit tedious to do for something like the Gobfin farm that we just mentioned, but the place this truly shines is for things like Alpha World Bosses. When you defeat one of these, they give you ancient technology parts, which are a resource that a lot of the more interesting crafts in the game require. If you then butcher a captured one of these Alpha World Bosses, you then get even more ancient technology parts from the same one, so basically, it's never worth killing an Alpha Pal straight up if you can avoid it, always at minimum capture them to be able to do this, even if you don't want to actually keep them. This extends even further to the Alpha World Bosses that have legendary schematic drop chances such as King Paka. He has a chance to drop a schematic on defeat, and you get two rolls at this per spawn if you were to capture him and then butcher him. Not that I would ever endorse butchering this beautiful ball of fluff, and I honestly feel really bad for having pressed that button. But that pretty much does it for today then everyone. 10 sort of secrets, things that I just wish that I knew so much earlier in my journey playing Power World myself that hopefully will help you all out too. I hope you've enjoyed this and hopefully it actually makes your journey a bit better. Like if you liked the video, subscribe to the notification bell for more. And most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world our stage Is, uh, goodbye